Our first guest is a researcher at Data and Society Research Institute. She's been featured in NBC, oh, the New York Times, Club. Associated Press, and TechCrunch. Ladies and gentlemen, Robin Kaplan. <laughs> Our next guest is an author of the best-selling book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, featured in the uh, Harvard Business Review, TechCrunch, and uh, Psychology Today. Please welcome Nir Eyal. <laughs> And last but not least, we have the director of UX Advice and co-founded a startup called Threadflip. Please welcome Jess Brown. All right, so let's, uh, let's start us off with some conversation here, right? And that's why we have everybody here and then the audience questions. So you might have seen this. This happened uh, recently. The man who invented the Facebook like button, and that would be Justin Rosenstein, uh, back in 2007, last year actually deleted the app from his phone, right? So the very person who designed the, uh, the Facebook like, like button now has deleted it. So should we be worried? Robin, what do you, what do you think? Is that, a, is that a sign of the apocalypse or is this just one person's opinion? Um, I actually don't think he's the only one. There's been some key advisors that were early on Zuckerberg advisors um, that have said that they actually don't let their children use the app. So there does so seem to be something kind of fundamentally wrong with the incentive structure of, of Facebook that early designers are starting to recognize and warn people against. They're having like an Oppenheimer moment, right? It's like I'm the becomer of death, Shiva. <laughs> But near, it's a, you might it's a reference a, to the atomic bombs of the 1950s, by the way. Comedy! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're realizing, I'm assuming they're realizing that there's harm and... Right, and, they are kind know, of backpedaling a little idea. bit to say, oops, my bad. <laughs> my <laughs> they, bad. I don't think they hand back their, their money, but uh, so near, what, what about from your end, from the design perspective? Obviously, this is an area that you're, you're pretty well known into looking at how we can build uh, products to a certain level of stickiness, as, as we might say. So what do, you, what do you think about this, this current issue that's, that's going on? Yeah, I think, um, uh, look, every technological revolution has a downside, right? There's always a cost. Uh, so if you look at the agricultural revolution, right now we have more calories than we know what to do with. We can feed every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth for the first time in human history. But of course now we have obesity. Uh, with the uh, Industrial Revolution, right, we have cars, we have airplanes, we have all these blessings of the Industrial Revolution, but we have pollution. So I think the, there are, we're, what we're coming to grips with is that there are a lot of bad repercussions to the information age. And so when it comes to products like Facebook, I think it's terrific for us to take a step back and say, look, there's a lot of good things that, uh, that social media can do for us, and there's potentially a lot of bad things as well. And I think that's a, a, a natural, healthy discussion that we have to figure out how do we use these products in a way that serves us versus a way that you know, the, the products uh, are something that we abuse or overuse or something that we are serving. Okay. So Jess, do you think, what, what do you about think this is like a, a phase that we're going through because this is all so new, so everyone's using it, and hopefully the next generation will learn to limit themselves? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think this is the crisis that Facebook is going through right now. That right now there's a lot of press, there's a lot of media saying big back Facebook is hijacking our brains. Facebook is going to bleed usage over the next few years. So I don't need to be as apocalyptic because I feel like this is all going to somehow destroy us all. Is, that, is there any truth to that or? Go for it. <laughs> I'm assuming there is from the silence from the panel. Well, just what about from your end, right? You went to Stanford. That's an area, kind of a hotbed of activity recently, uh, sp specifically with the uh, time well spent type of movement, which was potentially co-opted by Zuckerberg in a statement using that very phrase, which was a, a movement about kind of uh, increasing well-being. Do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, Rosenstein didn't say he was going to delete the app and delete his account, right? That's not a, an incredibly extreme reaction. It was like, I don't want it on my phone, perhaps because the phone as an ecosystem is an easier way to get sucked in and frequently reminded as opposed to saying, you know, I'm gonna use Facebook in moderation. And I'm going to be a little more in control of when I opt in. It's like uh, drinking. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so you Just that will like be a drinking. phrase in the future, tech responsibly? Something like that. It was interesting, uh, last week, a bunch of Stanford CS students went to Apple headquarters and protested and said, you know, they wanted Apple to put together some kind of um, 
light mode that would, like airplane mode, only enable certain limited interactions as opposed to every notification coming through. So there's already a Google Chrome extension that is kind of that. Yeah. Well, there has been, I mean, for, for years, right? You probably all know about these, but it was developed originally for, for writers to have uh, freedom and rescue time. Tim Ferriss, I think, was behind one of those. So that, they've been around for, what, like eight, eight years? Now you have Ariane Huffington with Thrive Global getting into this, this tech wellness space. I mean, do you And, s and they do yeah. respond, right? So Apple, you know, when people were having a this public outcry about the fact that blue light from your iPad or your iPhone makes it difficult to sleep, well, they added, I think it's called night shift mode, right, where you set yeah. this timer, and, and there's this great do not disturb mode now that they added with the last iOS update where if you say you're driving, it'll send an automatic oh, message right. back. Yep. So I would put money on the fact that they will create all kinds of ways to Im improve the, the quality of the user experience by cutting down a lot of these superfluous notifications. I mean, that doesn't really impact the amount of money that they're about to make, though. I think the, the key thing to remember with Facebook, and something that people really don't consider that much, is that it actually doesn't matter how much people are on the platform. Facebook is making money regardless of whether or not you go on Facebook. It makes money by this thing called Pixel that is installed on every, almost every single website around the world, on the ads that are being served through using the Facebook audience network. So Facebook as itself, what we should be worried about is not necessarily how much we're on Facebook, but how much Facebook is kind of on us, tracking us wherever we go and then making money off of that. That's that whole thing of like, we're the product, not the yeah, consumer. Yeah, if, if you're not paying for it, you're, you're, the, you're the product, yeah. I thought it was free, I thought they were being nice. <laughs> not, not that there isn't things you can do about that too, right? You installed a, an app blocker, an ad blocker, excuse me, which is most of them are free, and a lot of that stuff is taken care of as well. So a lot of this is uh, about consumer education. It's about you know, responsible media usage. Uh, not that I think companies should make it a whole lot easier. Right? I think there's a lot that Facebook could do. I think there's a lot that Apple will do uh, to make cutting back on usage easier. So how do we strike that balance? What do you think, Jess, with, between uh, a user and their own personal responsibility versus the company and maybe their new corporate social responsibility of making sure that it's not overly kind of abusive or as Robin just mentioned, maybe the, the privacy concerns? Well, I think it's, it depends a lot on the company. Like Apple as a company, their business is about selling hardware and so creating a light mode wouldn't go counter to their interests. Facebook, on the other hand, like has an incentive to get as much information about people as possible. So I would think that that's not necessarily going to come from within that company, but perhaps like regulatory bodies saying like you can't track all of this information or you have to allow people to erase it or you have to disclose more of what is actually being captured. So do you think that that type of business model will, uh, will ever, ever change what I'm thinking? Uh, specifically, there was a recent piece in the New York Times Magazine by John Herman. Uh, he was discussing these people who uh, are criticizing uh, the addictive qualities of tech, right? People like uh, Justin Harris, Center for Humane Technology. Uh, so he writes, these critics offer broadsides, a warning about addictive design tricks and profit-driven systems eroding our humanity. But it's hard to discern the collective message. Is it in the design that needs fixing? Is it tech? Is it capitalism? So what do we think right there? What's, what should the, the focus be on? Is it solely design or is it something a little larger that, that might need to be corrected? What do you, what do you think, Robin? Um, I think there's a real concern about the values that are driving this technology. Like Facebook was initially built as a hot or not machine, as we all know. It was initially built so we could go through and, and look at it. It kind of still is. Is that, yeah, a little bit. At least the way I use it. <laughs> Um, and, and now they're, they, actually over the last long while, they've been placing these really grand missions on their companies, uh, on their companies as well. So right now it's, for Facebook, it's building global community. Now what that means within that is totally up to their discretion and currently, unfortunately, because of the way the regulatory structure is set up in the United States, we actually have no recourse. We have no balance to that power. As I said before, they can collect information about us no matter where we go online. And the FCC has no authority. The FTC has limited authority. But we have this funny thing called Section 230 that also gives these platforms a lot of immunity from liability. 
Um, and so I think. I'm sorry, what was it? Section what? Yeah. Section 230. I don't want to bore everybody. Right there. What, what, <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> what is, <laughs> is that? The Telecommunications Act in 1996, yeah. the Decency uh, That's Act. where you're the expert, yeah, and I'm the that, That's basically the, uh, the legal loophole that, that prevents tech companies from getting in trouble. So, for example, a couple of years ago when you had the, the Craigslist killer, uh, when you have uh, Craigslist being used for uh, prostitution, the reason why those companies aren't sued is because they basically ab absolve a, a tech company from that responsibility based on the argument that it's too much to, to handle. So how do we balance innovation? But obviously, in 1996, uh, there were no social networks. So right, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem coming from both sides. I hate using that phrase now. Um, but it's com this kind of combination of an, a tremendous amount of optimism and idealism that surrounded this, this tech industry and a total lack of future thinking that we would need some sort of safeguard or some sort of counterpower to like balance it out. What do you think that's the point where we're at right now in, in 2018 where we've kind of uh, peeled back a little bit and say, maybe we shouldn't have been so optimistic, right? You can't see red flags if you have rose-colored glasses. I mean, we're, we're kind of in this tech backlash point. So just, do you, do you think we're gonna move outside of that? I mean, we, we can't be down and depressed forever now, can we? It seems like a very dark period in tech is basically what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it relies on people coming to their own, I mean, and maybe it is like drinking, coming to their own rock bottom of like- I'm drunk I'm, on Facebook right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm t spending too much time here and it's not increasing my quality of life. Um, I think it is easier for adults to come to that conclusion than younger people who maybe are in a community of peers where everyone is doing something very similar and spending more and more time on Snapchat or Instagram. Like, I think it's, uh, a challenge, like it's challenging enough for people to recognize that when all of their friends are not spending so much time there. I, mean, I, I think that uh, there's definitely going to be some common sense re regulation that comes down the, the pipes eventually that, you know, it makes no sense to me why if you advertise on uh, Facebook for a political ad, why are there different standards than advertising on television or radio? They should all be marked as political ads. I think bots should, should likely be banned on many of these platforms. There's a lot of common sense stuff that's going to come down the pipe. However, I think that the current drumbeat of, you know, these big bad companies need to change and it's all their fault. I mean, the line I keep repeating is if, if you hold your breath waiting for these companies to change, you're going to suffocate. Yeah, business is going to business. Right. And, and there's, there's, on the other hand, there's so many easy things that we can do, right? I mean, for all the, the mind manipulation, and I wrote a whole book about all the things that they do to hook us, uh, you know, there's nothing Mark Zuckerberg can do if you uninstall the app from your phone. Right? I don't have Facebook on my phone. I use Facebook. I use it on my desktop during a time of day when I want to use Facebook, not when the app maker pings and dings and rings me on their schedule, but I use it on my schedule. And so I think all these, these kind of common sense uh, tactics that we can all take, there ain't nothing Mark Zuckerberg can do to put that app back on your phone. Yeah, but that's like the same argument for like the heroin epidemic. Yeah. It's like, well, just don't do heroin. You know what I mean? It's, it? like, it's almost like... Probably not. Yeah, it's but, okay. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is like, uh, you know, the it, Facebook is designed to the little pleasure sensor in your brain. Right, it, right. But it feels good every time you get that notification. So yeah, it's but, hard but show, for some people to delete it. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, but so is everything, right? So I just moved to New York from San Francisco. And um, you guys have so many good things as you walk down the street here in New York that, you know, I feel like going into some of these bakeries and cafes and saying, God damn you, why do you have so many sweet, delicious desserts everywhere, right? How dare you tempt me all the time? But you know what? That's kind of the price of progress. The price of living in a world with so much innovation, with so much choice, with so much goodness in the world, yeah. is that we also have to bear somewhat of that burden to say, you know what, we gotta put in this place. And to give some historical perspective, this ain't nothing new, folks, right? We said the same thing about television was melting our brains and that radio was going to make everybody into idiots and the novel was going to make everybody and, into stupid idiots. And then idiots. we regulated, to be honest. Well, like, after those moments of right, right, and we should, we should, we should regulate. I agree, we should regulate. <laughs> I'm not saying we shouldn't regulate. But if you wait for regulation, you're going to waste all those years of life that you could have had. <laughs> also, to just jump on your regulation thing, for there to be smart regulation, you need smart people elected. Because if you have people that 
are in the pockets of uh, a certain company or something, they're not going to push for regulation, or at least regulation that's fair to the I'd, masses. I'd that's actually say more right fair now, for the, like, the tech industry right now is our is our best bet. That's actually the scariest part about what's happening right now is that they have full leeway to be able to make these decisions, decisions about content, what content stays and what content doesn't, what content gets prioritized and, and not prioritized. It's not a matter of demonizing them. It's a matter of figuring out how we work best with tech companies. I know that sounds terrible, yeah. but right now, the way that everything is structured, it is actually... So is Mark Zuckerberg hard. really going to run for president? <laughs> Uh, well, we'll find out, but I think that's why a lot of people use the, the Ralph Nader unsafe at any speed type of analogy, that it wasn't until Ralph Nader came in and, and bear, said, right? right? well, he basically said, all right, well, we need to have seatbelts, and here's why. Oh, and the wait. argument before was, was that, uh, that, well, you could just drive slower, and the very idea of seatbelts is going to make, uh, make a person drive faster because they think they're in invincible, but obviously seatbelts have saved a lot of lives, and the but, same thing but, later uh, on with mother, Mothers Against Drinking and Driving. What they won't regulate, though and what you can't regulate is to make the product less fun to use. That ain't going away, folks. Right? You can regulate bots, you can regulate political advertising, you can regulate a bunch of different things. These companies are not, there's no law that's going to be passed that say, you know what, can you make Facebook less interesting for me? I like to use it a lot. <laughs> can you make it not so cool? But there are nutritional labels, right, on, on, on food, kind of to indicate to that person, all right, this is fatty food, whereas I think some of the struggle that people might have is that uh, the person developing it knows how the sausage is made, but the person consuming it uh, doesn't, doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. And this is not, again, this is not a new problem, right? If you think about the average American spends five hours a day watching television, 30 minutes a day on average on Facebook. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, is, is five hours of watching Sean Hannity on Fox better or worse than 30 minutes on Facebook interacting with, you know, grandma and grandpa and auntie well, and uncle. they used to no have a regulation. Fox is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, it's, it's not a new problem, right? In the 90s, they had the fairness doctrine that was removed, where you wouldn't have a Fox News, at least the way Fox News is right now, you wouldn't have it in its current state because that, was, that regulation was removed. And now we have Fox News because of that. I'm running for president. <laughs> you are. Well, let's let's move on from me. from regulation. Enough regulation. Uh, this is a story a lot of you might have uh, heard about. So people across the country uh, recently were freaked out as they heard the random laughter of Alexa from their Amazon Echo. So just random laughter, Joe, happening in the in the background. So the company. That's why I perform in front of a bunch of Alexas now. <laughs> We're just going to replace everybody with uh, with Alexa. So uh, the company admitted that this this was an issue. Uh, they were claiming that the trigger phrase Alexa laugh was receiving a lot of false positives. So uh, this thought of, of a device that's always listening that kind of freaked out a lot of people, especially hearing this random laughter. Is this something we should be be worried about? Robin, let's let's start with you. Is this this very idea that all right? If if you're if Alexa starts laughing at you, it also triggers in your mind. Wait a minute, this device could turn on at any time. Is it is it being used to spy on me? Does it trigger this kind of Orwellian fear that might, we might have? Uh -huh. Well, so I just learned about this last night, and I was deeply. Amused. It just happened. It's just a new thing. <laughs> I can feel like it was kind of like the creepy clowns sort of thing, where like all of a sudden, like everybody just said, I, I heard Alexa. She started laughing know, at me. No, it's it's. It's pretty hilarious. Uh, it's funnier than my, my nephew, his favorite thing is to go up to Alexa and say fart, because she makes fart noises if you do oh, that. Wow. So that's the alternative, I guess. Still funny. Um, <laughs> he, does, he does that for like hours on end. So that's actually an interesting component of what you were saying before about like you can choose to turn Facebook off and then you cut Zuckerberg off. That's actually not true, because we have Facebook on. We're transmitting data about your location as well. So whether or not a device is listening to you all the time, and, and I'm not, I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. I can't tell you whether or not Alexa, Alexa is listening to everything that you're saying or what's happening to that, that information. But privacy is very, very networked um, regardless. Because we all have devices in our pockets, we are transmitting information about every other person in this room. Um, so we should be concerned about kind of the aggregate impacts of these technologies for certain. They're able to do that with old, uh, like cold murder cases with flip phones. They're able to go back 20 years and see, well, this flip phone was in this location. This is not with smartphones, with old school flip phones. Uh, and see, well, the person was here, that's kind of uh, ruins their alibi a bit. And then there was the issue with OnStar that, that had uh, kind of a suit connected with them that it could turn on 
potentially to track down uh, drug dealers who were driving oh, really? <laughs> driving cars years ago. With, I need to sell OnStar. my car. But, but just let, let's think about this. Uh, really what we're getting at is, do you think the average person is going to become comfortable with this, this voice technology where they're just going to say, all right, well, I just want uh, my Amazon Echo here or Alexa kind of in the background? Because it does seem to be a high growth area. I think the average person is already comfortable with voice control. Like there are so many devices in people's homes and I think a lot of people are saying to themselves, well, that's the price of convenience. And just like, well, I want my convenience and I'm not really concerned. Like Amazon already knows everything about me. I buy half my stuff on Amazon. Like why shouldn't they just have a little more information if I can? know the weather or turn on my lights when I get home by telling Alexa to do it for me. Um, I think that a lot of people have already sort of thrown in the towel in a way and gone, well, I don't have my, my privacy anymore, which is, I think so that is So is privacy concerning. dead? I mean, that's always kind of the big issue. We kind of say privacy is dead, long live privacy. I mean, is it, or is it just a different kind of permutation of privacy? I mean, I don't think privacy should be dead. I think the digital realm and the expectation of privacy has changed quite a lot where people don't expect to be able to keep their privacy no matter what they're doing on the open web. And even on the deep web, it's like, okay, you might still be leaving a digital trail and people are more aware of that generally. Um, but I think not having privacy in the digital space is an issue and not having privacy in your home and your conversations could become sure. an issue. It feels like the young, like younger, as speaking as if I'm an old man, but like younger generations could almost could care less about privacy or they separate, they have an online persona and they have their online self and then they have their reality self. And they're kind of two different. Or they don't mind that all their information is out there. Yeah. Are we just a bunch of grandpas? I, mean, I, I think that's where we like we need to start understanding where the privacy conversations have gone real awry. Talking about privacy for the sake of privacy is nonsensical. Like it doesn't yeah. just the take it, talking about it without out of context as a kind of a fundamental right. It actually isn't a fundamental right. What we need to be talking about it is in the context of what happens with that data. So connecting it to conversations about targeted advertisement or targeted political speech. That is the implications of these like of these devices hearing everything and knowing everything about you. It's not a, that it just knows everything about you. It's that it can target messages messages specifically to you, and that can be very powerful. When you say like it's not a fundamental right, you mean like it's not in the, the constitution that we get privacy. It's not light and life, liberty, and the pursuit of don't look at me. You know, like it's yeah, it's, it's, it's covered. <laughs> I think my like my friend would know this better, but I think it's covered in like tort law. But it's but it's. We won't ask the audience right now. <laughs> there's some there's some lawyers in the room, um, but yeah, no, it's not a it's not yeah. a fundamental right. Interesting. All right, let's uh, let's switch the topic. There's some new research that you you also might have heard. Uh, is at MIT that just happened uh, yesterday, the day before. They found that uh, false news claims were 70 percent more likely than the truth to be shared on Twitter. While a lot of attention has been placed on the role of bots in spreading fake news, the researchers found that humans tend to actually be the culprit. They actually took out the bot kind of perspective and they found that uh, it's humans that, that seem to want to, uh, to share the fake news. So, so Nir, what do, you, what do you think about this? I mean, is this, should we be wary? Should we be training people differently? Well, I, Design I think problem? I think it's gonna, so the reason this happens is because of variable rewards. The things that are novel, things that are, uh, new things that are uh, exaggerated things that are different get our attention uh, right if you if you turn on the news uh, you know they don't tell you about all the good things that were expected to happen today they tell you about the terrible things that nobody expected to happen today that's what makes news interesting so it would make sense uh, that you know claims that are outlandish are the ones that get spread more uh, on, on a face on a platform like Facebook or Twitter um, now what we, we don't know yet is how people will adapt to that. Will people kind of say, you know, will they learn from this? Will there be uh, kind of a, a new filter formed for, for folks that they can better understand what's uh, reality and what's fake? Uh, might there be more programmatic ways that these companies implement to kind of highlight how these, uh, if these stories are real? But as you know, right, and Robin, yourself, uh, a lot of the efforts to curb fake news or misinformation have been really unsuccessful. Even the very idea of labeling something potentially fake 
uh, oftentimes maybe deepens the conspiracy that somebody might feel, right? Pizza that's how gate. conspiracy theories tend to spread, is that yeah. if you tell somebody, well, that's fake, that's, that's part of the conspiracy. I mean, there's legitimately people who think that uh, the Simpsons predicted 9-11. I but mean, but some of it, too, thing. is a bit of, um, you know, people have been spreading fake news forever, right? That's, that's not a new phenomenon. Uh, what we don't know yet is how will we adapt to that phenomenon, right? We have this new medium that's brand new. A, a lot of the coverage of fake news comes from people who are spotting it and saying that's fake news, right? There was that, uh, there's been many outlandish stories that because somebody on the other side says, no, that's fake, then it blows up and gets even more press. So part of it is, will this story continue to be interesting in the next five, 10 years? So I, I don't know, nobody knows Here's, the answer. I have, a, I have a quick question that's just jumped in my head. I could edit this out because this could be a stupid question. Uh, is it all just tribalism? Is there not even news anymore? It's like, uh, this news, if, you know, even if the other side labels it as fake, it's like, well, you're labeling it as fake, but we want to see if we can get the narrative out and, and get it to stick for our side. It's about winning the day, not about spreading fact. The, the short answer is yes. I'm leaving it in then. <laughs> um, you know, from the research that we've done, and actually, I mean, just from the... I don't know. I don't know how to say this in a way that's funny or succinct or like would make sense in this format, but... Just spill it out. <laughs> whatever, you say it, I'll try to make a joke on it. Let's see if we can make it happen. But yeah, no, increasingly what we're finding is that people, what people perceive as true depends on their social community. That is just, I mean, it has always been true, um, more or less. It's becoming more and more true now. Um, and what is one social community right now also is what is one social media community. Um, so these lines are starting to kind of divide more and more. They're trying, the, the gaps are starting to deepen, I suppose. Yeah. I have no joke. Yeah, just, do you have any? I oh, sorry. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's also a business landscape related to media on the internet, right? Like 90% of media dollars, ad dollars, are going to two companies, Google and Facebook, and that leaves less and less of a share for publishers to be producing high quality news. What about all that choice we were talking about before? Yeah, no, that's a huge problem. They effectively have a duopoly right now oh, no. in the area okay, of Okay, but that's for the advertising market. We're Which not is what publishers also survive off of. Right, but that's not about consumers, right? We have lots of choice in terms of what we're gonna pay attention to. So even, so the people who, for example, um, there's been a lot of research that shows that, that, w that we have very little idea of actually how much fake news really changes people's uh, voting patterns or their other behaviors because they're, they're, there's this other mix of media diet that they receive. So this idea that you know, two companies, they have dominance in the app, uh, eyeball market. That has how much, time much to do with the fact that you actually just can't control that many variables when sure. you're talking about how people consume information in real space and in real time. So that, that has just as much to do with that as, as anything else. Right, I, I just think it's, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of, of vitriol coming from uh, traditional media towards yeah. new media uh, for a number of different reasons. Spotting it, look, people have a negativity bias. We have built it's into our like DNA. Bookstores were mad at Amazon in the early 2000s. Sure, sure. And, and, and I guess what you're saying, but are you saying that there's fake news doesn't have as much as an impact as we think it does? Is that what you're saying? I think that's probably true. I think we're way overestimating. Look, fake news have, has happened. Uh, my dad has said some crazy stuff. Exactly. That he read online. Look, that Sunday is true, and I'm sure there's a lot more of my dad out there than there are. Not rational thinkers. That's a mean thing to say. He doesn't listen to this. Right. Uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, all I'm trying to say is people read things on the internet, especially an older generation. They take it as gospel. They don't see it the way we see it. We were like, well, this is all crowdsourced, or it's made, or you know, they think they view the internet like they view TV and it has some sort of authority. Well, they got it put online. I sent him a YouTube video I made. He's like, oh, you, you were in this video. This is amazing. You're going somewhere. Like, I made this. I was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> you know, like, this is like a, a random thing I just put on YouTube. I, I think I, that's a lot of that older generation thinks that. Sure, and this could very well be a generational thing. Yeah. It very well could be. They vote uh, the most, though. And right. they, they, ha they have the most free time and right. they have the most money to And there's pump lots of behavioral stuff. habits, by the way, that, you know, what, what I study, what I research in terms of people's day-to-day -day habits and uh, how they interact with technology, it's amazing how differently uh, younger generations interact with their technology. For example, you know, I hear a lot about uh, people saying, oh, people are so distracted with their devices, they're always on it, you can't have a conversation over dinner with people anymore. Yeah. What's interesting is that when I taught at Stanford and I taught the undergrads, yeah. and I would watch them, like, what would happen during a break? 
They wouldn't do that to each other. The younger kids, they, they weren't the ones that were fubbing each other. I think the younger, but, younger but the older folks. So when I go yeah. teach corporates, that's when the highest paid person in the room, right? The older folks, they're the ones taking out their devices and you know. They treat it more like a newspaper, where like uh, uh, the younger generation treats it more as like a social thing. They're just right. with their friends. Right, and they understand that it's rude to do certain things with it. So just like smoking, you know, when I was a kid. The older generation, or the younger generation. I'm sorry. The, the younger generation is, is learning. It's rude. Yes, exactly. Right. So when I when I was a kid, um, 1980s, growing up, my parents had ashtrays all over the house. Uh, my mom never smoked. My dad had quit smoking years prior. And yet there was this expectation that when you came over to our house, it, you wanted to light up. There had to be an yeah. ashtray there. That's just what we did. It's common but courtesy. It, exactly. But today, you can't light up in my house. Are you kidding? I kick you out. Right? That would be ridiculous. Yeah. So I think we're going to see. We're already seeing in the younger generations that people are changing their relationship with technology. It is no longer okay to use your damn phone at the table at dinner time. And that's that's a cultural mooring. So you that's think that etiquette learning. is just being kind of set right? It's changing. I think the same this. thing is going to happen with how we digest news. Right? Getting yeah. your news from Facebook or Twitter as your primary news source is stupid. It is not a good medium. That's, and I think people are learning that. Yeah, I think people are learning that. Just I'm sorry to interrupt you again. I didn't want to say something. But just one last statement towards that. I think younger generations, younger people, use the internet more as a tool, and especially a lot of trolling goes on that can. Uh, Fool these older people that are reading. You know, they'll get the Ford Ford, the Ford is from, Ford's from Grandma as a subreddit. Because we see it as hilarious. Right. They don't. And there could be that trickery, you know. There's a lot of trickery. Yeah. There's, there's That's my slogan for my <laughs> 2020 campaign. But, but we should, we should be very suspicious. Whenever people to get together and say, those stupid people, they are tricked, we got to be careful about that. Totally. Because, because if we're not tricked, there's probably other people who are just as smart as we are out there too. It's yeah. not that we're not that gullible as a species. Totally. There are lots of people who get tricked. I, I agree with you, mm -hmm. but we, we we can't go overboard and say everybody is you know this is tricking yeah. everybody. You know I'm gonna say I'm gonna agree with you in part here, which I think is the first time this has happened tonight. Um, <laughs> fake news is spread mostly around like not mostly but much more around older populations than it is around younger populations yeah, right. in terms of like kids spontaneously learning this etiquette I'm, I'm really curious as to how that happens like kids normally learn things from your parents I assume that that's how you expect your child to learn things so how kids Actually, are learning from peers, the data from, shows from that peers people as learn well from peers yeah. way exactly. more than so that's an interesting area where I'd love to see some research I actually oddly as a media researcher I actually don't know where kids are getting their news, which is kind of frightening. Um, I have and then no obviously idea. The, the where we're getting Jake our Paul. news changed with, <laughs> hopefully not, and uh, uh, where we're getting our news changed with the recent change of the algorithm for, for Facebook that placed less emphasis on some of those news platforms, right? So you had that, uh, that difference. So I think right now we want to start going into our game that we're going to do, word association. And then Joe, you're going to lighten it up a bit. That we are. We want to get into a fun little game. Uh, we're going to play a little word association. David is going to read a word, and I want you guys to just react. When you hear a word, I want you to just say the first thing that pops in your head. Uh, like, uh, for example, give me a word, and I'll say the first thing that pops in my head. Oh, we were saying apple. Core. That's there it. There you go. That's all we're doing. Uh, and then, while that's going on, uh, Kate is going to go around and pick up your common card. So if you have little questions you want to ask, write your email, join our list. We give away fun prizes, uh, Twitter and stuff like that. And we're going to pick some random ones, and we're going to give away all this fun, cool stuff here, like uh, X.AI was gracious enough to give us t-shirts to hand out. Uh, we also have the No Phone. Which you, this is a No Phone selfie edition, which is basically just a mirror. That's all it is. That's all, <laughs> these guys, uh, they were basically on just Shark Tank. Uh, unfortunately, did, they did not uh, receive millions Did Mark of Cuban pay for this? Uh, actually, none of them did, but... Uh, uh, this is such a Cuban they, idea. They laughed at the, the, the idea, but Mark the, the, the point was... Uh, <laughs> If you're really struggling with your, your phone, you can yeah. carry it in your pocket. And it feels just like a phone, but it does yeah. absolutely And nothing. after a couple beers, you can have a filter, which is just... <laughs> there you go. Blurry so, eyes. So, let's so yeah, uh, okay, raise your hand. Kate sure. will grab it for you and uh, go along with okay. the game, David. So, again, uh, Robin, we'll start with you, and then I'm just going to kind of go around. I'm just going to say a word. You don't think. You just spit out what comes to mind. So when I say the phrase... Attention economy. Clicks. Near. Growing. Okay. Jess. Data. Okay. Mm. All right. Now. What was the word? I wasn't listening. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it was the, the attention was economy. His attention was elsewhere. Yeah. Your, 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 your phone was vibrating. Uh, your, your I was pocket. looking at that notebook. Damn thing. Uh, so, Near, we'll start with you here. Uh, privacy. Thank you. Uncertainty. 
Okay. Jess. Maybe. Robin. Gone. Gone. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, I agree with. Have that. a beer after the show if anybody feels <laughs> yeah. uh, feels depressed. All right. So Jess, we'll start with you here. Misinformation. Frequent. Okay. Robin. First thing that pops up. Misinformation. Disinformation. Okay. Near. Nothing new. Nothing new? Yeah. Okay. So you know, they had a big problem with fake news when books first, after the uh, uh, printing press. They were, they were printing a bunch of books and they had a huge problem with it. And then slowly but surely we were able to, you know, figure out which books are telling the truth. And uh, Yeah. I don't know why I brought that up. <laughs> well, we'll see how we, we deal with this sure struggle though. right now, but we do have... A bunch of uh, questions that All we right. want to start going over. Ladies and gentlemen, we got your audience questions. And for our podcast listening uh, audience, I'm putting them through a very advanced shuffling machine that's going to digitally select a question from the audience. And they'll be the winner of an X.AI sweater. Hopefully it fits, because I only got one. Uh, so either you can keep it or give it to a loved one. Makes a good gift. First question is from Jake. I believe, uh, at, oh, Jake Kahana. Jake Kahana, previous guest of ours. <laughs> uh, he will, he asked the question, uh, should a designer agree to a, oh my lord, core of ethics like a doctor? Should a designer agree to a core of ethics like a doctor? Hot area right now, right? Should it be like doctors? And who should write it? Oh, it's, and who should write it? It's a good question. Uh, so, so I have a chapter in my book called The Morality of Manipulation, where I give this two-part test for, for anyone who wants to build a product uh, using these persuasive tactics, but for good. Uh, and, and just to be clear, I didn't write my book for Facebook and Twitter and Google. Like, I use them as case studies so that other people could build habit-forming products that help people you know, live better lives, save money, exercise more, etc. So there's a two-part test that I, 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 I want people to take, which is the first part of the test is to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, is what you're working on materially improving people's lives? Right? Only you can answer that question. But do you believe in your heart of hearts that what you're working on materially improves people's lives? But that's not good enough. The second part of the question is, I want people to break the first rule of drug dealing. You know what the first rule of drug dealing is? Come up with a cool name to call yourself. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the like, second rule. Oh, okay. The first rule is never get high on your own supply. Mm. Oh, yes. So I want people to break that rule. And I believe if you're the kind of person who A, believes that you are materially improving people's lives and you are the user, you know if there are any deleterious effects of these products. As we're now seeing from some of these founders from these tech companies that say, whoa, 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 this is actually, you know, has negative consequences as well. Tim Cook says he doesn't want his uh, nephew to use Right, it so well. I think that's, and, and look, there are always unforeseen consequences. Every technology, right? Paul Varillo said, when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. There's all, always a downside to a technology. But I want that maker to know that downside so that they're responsible for fixing it as well. So that's just two, two part test of this ethics question. I think in, designers are, a natural choice for this because they're empathetic, they're representing the user, they're thinking about the user, but I think it would have to go broader than that. It would have to go to product managers, to business people, to engineers, because you know designers aren't making a decision in a vacuum as much as they might want to do that. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, I heard about an MIT professor who's getting their CS grad students to watch episodes of Black Mirror. It's like considering a broader set of consequences and the thought of like, what if the system does get adopted at scale, I think is a really interesting one for people to be asking. Great. What she said. <laughs> Next question is from, is it Audrey or Ashley? Uh, is ethics the answer, right? Yeah. Is ethics the answer? And the winner of a t-shirt from X.AI. So what do we think there? I mean, is, is ethics maybe being emphasized too much? Is it is some, other, some other answer? Uh, with, with I'm not sure what the question is right now, but uh, I love you, Audrey. Um, is ethics the, the answer? Um, Again, yeah, I, to, to, the, to what question? To the, to the problem that we're in right now, I think what we need to do is take a pretty hard look at the, the power arrangements and asymmetries that are, that are happening right now that are quieting some voices and that are letting others speak very loudly. 
Um, I'm not sure if that's contained within ethics and that's contained within kind of and that was, that was kind of an argument that recently came out with yeah. Tim Berners-Lee the inventor of the uh, World Wide Web who, who kind of said for his new web foundation that it's a different power structure it's, it's too much power in certain kind of platforms too much power in certain kind of platforms and then not a real great understanding of the values that are driving it and how those can be changed. So this conversation between whether or not we should be promoting equality or equity, that's a huge um, converse conversation, spe specifically when it comes to things like hate speech versus free speech, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting divide. We are all supportive of free speech, but what about if that speech silences other people's free speech? That's a it's speech to a certain extent. You can't yell fire in a theater. Like right. there's, there, yeah. Right, but like I just can't <laughs> scream fire in this theater right now. No, that would please be don't. A bad, no. That would be a federal offense if I were to just shout fire right now. We only I'm not going to do that. that. I'm not going to do it. If it the rate. But that's what, but it, it, I, like the freedom of speech. That's technically like if you had un, if you had just unlimited free speech, you could do that. But you can't do it. It's illegal. Thing that's heinously sexist right now, or yes. horrifically racist, or yeah, accidentally <laughs> read on someone's email, and, and that horrible. would be perfectly okay, yeah. even if we might all like get up and leave anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. what do we think, Jess? What do, what do you think about the structure of how a lot of that speech is decided, right? Because we're kind of expecting this public square inside of a publicly traded company, so uh, a lot of these the determinations about what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, that's made at the the company level, right, through the offense of their terms of service. Uh, through uh, some of their content moderation and, and what they might be looking at. So do you, do you think that's something that we're, we're struggling with? Or do you yeah, definitely. I mean, take Instagram, for example. I think there were women on there who were breastfeeding who were, whose photos were removed, and there was a whole movement like, why is this being removed when women in bikinis and like all kinds of things that have a different tone and a different tenor and a different message are permitted? Um, I think it's really hard for people to write those moderation rules in a way that appeals to everyone because some people's speech is going to be removed according to those rules. Um, so I don't know how, like, it's a tough problem to solve. It's, all, it's like it, it depends on the designers. There's a bubble that we all have to kind of fit into the designer's ethics. Whoever designed the program saying breastfeeding is bad, if those core people believe it who designed the software, that is a worldwide software. And they happen to be 23-year-old boys. They happen to be 23-year-old boys, exactly. <laughs> who really like breasts and bikinis. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so you know, they're not mothers or parents, or you know, they, wouldn't, they would see it as offensive. Well, I think that's part of the struggle, right? Instead of uh, you know, the legal system just determining what is freedom of speech, what's appropriate, what's political, uh, what's going to be protected, it's, it's something that's a little more nebulous that also has a tough time translating across different cultural kind of boundaries uh, world, worldwide. Great. Uh, from back, the winner of the No Phone Original. Ooh, oh, collectors. Easy back. Uh, do employees at Apple, Amazon, Facebook, etc., bear any personal responsibility for the direction tech is going? What should they do? Wait, what was the beginning of the question again? Do employees at Apple, Amazon, Facebook, etc., bear ah. any responsibility for the direction tech is going? What should they do? Well, I will say I think they do feel responsibility, and a yeah. lot of them are leaking things, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. So within wow. these companies, a lot of the news stories that we're getting on a day to day, they're not leaking to me. So anybody who listens to this podcast, nobody's <laughs> leaking. Um, but they're, they're seeding things to a lot of the publications. A lot of the early things that came out in Gizmodo about the trending topics team, um, that mm -hmm. came from employees at Facebook. Um, early conversations about uh, whether or not Facebook needed to contend with... <laughs> right, they absolutely have the kind of margins. And that's exactly where you can, what you're going to see more of. It's also going to go involve people jostling these companies, too, and going after them. And right, and, them they, and they do have an economic model that necessitates that. I mean, I think Facebook's biggest challenge here and what we see See, you know, Facebook usage on a per user basis is going down. It is declining. And that's a huge problem for Facebook. And the reason that's happening is because people are, the, the variable reward phase that I talk about in my book, this, the, uh, the, the hook they have developed, when the hook become, when the reward becomes uninteresting, right? When it becomes full of fake news and crap and advertisements, people stop using the product. And that's an existential threat to the company. Yeah. Yeah, they're in their MySpace problem phase. Mm. 
I think I, I still have my profile. Yeah, you, I, there's a lot of discussion <laughs> that, that Facebook is just going to end up more and more like Instagram. Well, Facebook owns Instagram. Yeah, they oh, no, of course. Um, but so, Facebook like, that's proper. the other side of this. Is I mean, Facebook owns Instagram and Facebook owns WhatsApp, and those are two companies that are that are actually growing quite rapidly in terms of users. But, but I, I mentioned, of course, Instagram is owned by Facebook. The reason I mentioned is because nobody's complaining that you know Instagram changed the elections. They're complaining that fake news propagated yeah. on, on. By the way, follow us on Instagram at Funny As Tech. <laughs> Behind the scenes photos and more at Funny As Tech for all your tech comedy needs. Uh, question from Danny. Last of the gifts, the no phone selfie. <laughs> Fantastic. The no phone selfie is a fake phone for people who are addicted to real phones and selfies. That's what it says. Uh, can you talk a bit about how you feel about the robotization of jobs? Uh, like automation, I'm assuming. Uh, do you feel your job would be at stake? Hmm, the robot's coming for you? I think so. I've been uh, calling um, the management of distraction the skill of the next century, of this century, I should say. That that uh, our ability—it's not a new challenge that humans have been talking about. Um, you know, doing things against our better interests. Socrates and Plato talked about a crazy and this tendency that we have to do things against our interests 2,500 years ago. So that is not a new problem. What's become a greater challenge is that in an age where we are connected all the time, there is more ability to escape discomfort than ever before. And so I think managing uh, you know, the ability to, to manage your distraction, that is going to be the skill of this century. And the only protection that many jobs will have uh, from being automated away is the ability to focus, to concentrate, to think, and to develop new and novel approaches to problems. So is that going to happen? I mean, just what do you think? I mean, uh, are people being trained in a lot of those skills that we're going to need? If you're saying, okay, we need to have these kind of critical thinking type of type of skills, is this something that's going to happen? Because that's the, the million dollar question or billion dollar question right now is, uh, our job is going to uh, be, be decreased at a higher rate than they're being created? I mean, I, th that's a great question. I mean, some jobs, might not be that easily trans like skill sets might not translate that easily. I think skill sets that are around creativity, like that's a little bit more difficult for a machine to come up with, but and empathy, service level jobs, like that human touch I think will be required versus things that are easily repeatable or, I mean, even things that uh, have a large workforce behind them, if you're driving cars, if you're driving trucks, like that I would see as something where you do want to help those people find another skill that can be used. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Great, and for our final question of the night, sorry we have no gift, but your gift is to be the final question of the night. Uh, I had to pick a short one, I read one that was very long, uh, we'll try to uh, answer that one online. Uh, but our final question is from Daria. And the question is, what is tech companies' responsibility to limit trolling? Wow, that, that's a hot area right now, right? Should they have more responsibility to make sure that we have a vibrant and safe, uh, welcoming online environment? We can obviously uh, disagree about what that might mean, or one person's troll might be another person's free speech, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, I cannot yell fire in a... <laughs> in a Please don't. That is a federal offense. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the fundamental question right now of our era, is do these... Do these tech companies have a responsibility to kind of preserve a, a space for positive speech? Not necessarily positive speech, like speech that is positive in nature, but areas of speech where speech can flourish. Um, and in what ways is trolling um, kind of add to that conversation? And what in, in what ways does it does it really take away? Um, the real problem that we're having right now is. You know, trolling is being used by all sorts of different actors for all sorts of different aims. We're totally comfortable saying, okay, we don't want trolls from Russia to mm -hmm. come into our political space, but we have no way of telling when that is happening. Or, I mean, we have some ways of telling, but we don't have we don't have great ways of of drawing lines behind be, between different types of trolls or, or where things are coming from. So. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's so still do you think co Companies though, should they better enforce their terms of service? I mean, that's always a hot issue with something like Twitter. I right? think there's, you know, enforcement is always one way and that's kind of the knee jerk reaction is, you know, let's regulate. Um, and that probably has some room uh, to happen as well. But I think there's a lot of ways that we can use behavioral design 
to change people's actions when it comes to these toxic type of behaviors. There was a great case study done a few years ago about an online game that had this problem of trolling where it, it eroded the pleasure of people playing this online game when people would constantly berate each other. Like Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> That's a trolling thing. So. It's a very popular video online. Okay. Trolling will seem like a very impossible thing to regulate. Well, because there is always going to be someone who finds. Well, but you can you can have you can design systems that take this into account and reward people for acting a certain way. So they yeah. they implemented this game this system in this gaming company where you could start giving people props. You could start giving people points for behaving in ways that were pro-social. And then people who didn't have those points or people who were dinged and, and marked as, as trolls uh, were kind of, you know, didn't like playing the game very long because they couldn't participate. Their access was limiting. So you could imagine, I think very soon what we're seeing Twitter do uh, here the next year or so, I would predict, is we're going to start having verified accounts for everyone. And that's going to yeah. dramatically reduce trolling. We're also going to start, you know, Twitter could do simple things like saying we're going to amplify messages in there. You know, now that it's a, a programmatic feed as opposed to a chronological feed, you could imagine a future where people who spread junk and antisocial behaviors, their content is seen less. Whereas people who, uh, who spread content which is appreciated and pro-social rises uh, to the top. Yeah. I agree. I think there, there is a responsibility and there are ways to design for better behavior as opposed to just kind of leaning back and saying, well, we're not responsible for the speech on this platform. I mean, Twitter's already taken a few steps this last few months, this year. Um, and I would imagine that things like that are going to continue to happen. I think it's just hard when there are a couple platforms that are at such large scale, we don't really find the equivalent of like the broken window problem in a public space where you're like, oh, I actually can learn that in neighborhoods, if there's graffiti or if there's broken windows, like people are more likely to behave badly. Um, mm -hmm. There are enough platforms out there that maybe you start to get some of that and get the signal of like, okay, if you have upvoting and downvoting, you get better behavior. Or you have a, a code of conduct, you get better behavior. Well, obviously, comment sections have really struggled with this too, and they've tried to put in a lot of that design to kind of tilt us towards our uh, better angels. Also, moderation yeah. in comment sections. On that note, we have to go because we are over. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for your guests. Give it up for Robin Kaplan. Near Ayol and Jess Brown. Hey, I'm uh, uh, that's Nick Rock Bowler. I'm Julian Arno. Uh